So this is part two from Magi to Magistrate. In the last part, we looked at the kind of the my idea of what word magic is, what topics surrounding word magic we are going to explore. And this time we're going to look at the influences of the Magi, the magicians of ancient Persia, and how they've affected the mainstream Western religions and how that has gone uh, into, that has flowed into the the way the uh, sovereigns and the kings in Western Europe ruled and also how that filtered into the courts and into our modern society. So we're going to see this Persian influence uh, filtering down from the um, from the Magi all the way through to present day. And this is quite a fun one. Um, so also I should mention if you enjoy my content, if you like my channel, please uh, subscribe and feel free to participate. Uh, leave your comments, like the video, etc. I've been trying to build my channel for about a year now. And I want to say thank you so much, guys, for your support, uh, your kind words, your comments, questions. Uh, it's been really great. And, um, you know, when I started this, I wasn't sure that the way that I see the world would speak to very many people. But apparently it has been speaking to a good number of you. So thank you so much for um for everything that um for your participation and your support so i thank you very much for that so please subscribe um, if you want to support the channel so this is um what we're seeing here uh like we saw in the last part this is the fravashi on the left this is a zoroastrian symbol of essentially of human enlightenment and on the right this is a magistrate from the court, I believe it's King Edward. Don't quote me on which uh, exact monarch someone may be able to tell me, but this is a this is a magistrate or a judge of King Edward's court. And speaking of King Edward, this is King Edward the Third, and here he is depicted with the crowns of France and Scotland on his mighty sword. Symbols of claim and conquest to these kingdoms. So this is a symbol. King Edward III is holding a symbol of conquest and claim to both the thrones of Scotland and the thrones of France by having these crowns actually on his sword. He uh, was known, King Edward III was known for having just this mighty sword. He was a war king. And um, this is what this symbol is. But more importantly, in his left hand is the Globus Cruciger. And this is a symbol you see all over the place, especially when it's associated with the Catholic Church, of course. This is the, uh, the other name for it, of course, is the cross-bearing globe. And this object came about as a symbol of Christian dominion in the world, right? The Globus Cruciger is on top of every royal crown in Europe, representing the divine authority which rules over the monarch. So you can see King Edward III is holding this globe, and you see the Christian, you see the, the cross on top of the globe, right? And that's a symbol, of course, of, of the divine authority of God, all laws... Uh, ultimately coming from God, but also there's this um, kind of scary Christian um, dominion or attitude of dominance in the world, right? And if you make symbols, <laughs> symbols are so, uh, they tell you so much about um, a belief. They'll tell you so much about a doctrine. And this symbol, of course, is saying, hey, we are. Uh, we want to take over the world. We believe that we are justified in doing so, and this is what we're going to do. Right? It's a very bold, uh, very aggressive symbol, right? And it's on the top of pretty much every crown um, that you'll see. 
in uh, in the um, kingdoms of Europe. E- even I mean, e- Western Europe, Eastern Europe, all the way, all the way through Russia, you'll see this globus cruciger on top of the uh, the magistrates, uh, or the, I, I should say the sovereign king or queen's crown. So more more importantly, however, this the symbolism associated with the red and white cape worn by the king is what we're going to look at. Um, the, <laughs> this uh, red and white was inspired by the Pope. So from Pope Gregory the Seventh in the eleventh century, pictured in the upper left hand corner. The white robe and the red cape became the symbol of the papacy from that point forward. Okay? The white symbolizes the innocence of Christ, while the red is a symbol of his martyrdom. This color scheme is reversed for the king and his court, as you probably noticed. This reversal signifies the monarch's righteousness despite any bloodshed, since after all, it is the king who is exempt from the laws of men, right? So you can have a righteous king and still in the eyes of the court, the king's court in the eyes, of course, of the, the uh, holy Roman magi, the, the Vatican, the king is exempt from the laws of men. He's only answerable to, the monarch only answers to God. That is the um, that is the view of the monarch. That is the view of the church. That is just how, uh, that's their worldview, right? So by the 1300s, so a century and a half to two centuries after Pope Gregory VII starts wearing this, um, what it lo- what it appears to look like some sort of a Santa Claus or an Amanita muscaria uh, mushroom kind of outfit. It's deeply symbolic, of course. But by the 1300s, under the decree of King Edward the Third, the guy we saw on the last slide, the Holy Roman style of dress was adopted by the king and his court, and of course it filtered down to his magistrates. We see an image in the lower right of a magistrate of the King Edward's court by incorporating a similar appearance to the Magi of Rome. And now I should clarify, when I say the Magi of Rome, I, of course, mean the Vatican. I mean the the Pope, the bishops, all of the, uh, the Catholic Church. So when I refer to the Magi or the Holy Roman Magi, that's what I mean. Because essentially, of course, they're, um, they've taken the traditions from the East and have kind of flipped them, given them their own flavor and called it their own, right? That's essentially what's happening here. So by incorporating a similar appearance to the Magi of Rome, the king and his magistrates assumed the roles of lawgivers under authority of God, right? That's the only, by the way, that's the only way, I mean, that mirrors the belief in the East, where God, uh, the law has come from God alone. There's no man above another man. That is an Eastern idea. Um, but very um, surreptitiously, or I should say very um, very stealthily, the magistrate attempts to usurp this divine authority from the Holy Roman Magi or the Vatican. And becomes almost and you know very much like a like a pharaoh or an emperor right so the creation of laws and passing judgment to the accused in the ultimate sense was understood to be the sole authority of god right he's the ultimate judge the magistrate as an ancient as an as an agent of the king takes on certain executive powers in the name of the divine's appointed sovereign ruler, right? So he's taking on the garb. This magistrate here is taking on the garb of King Edward, King Edward III. And, of course, King Edward III 
has adopted his style of dress from the Holy Roman Magi, right? So he's, he's, these, these powers are being filtered down to the judge, uh, the judges and the magistrates who uh, write and judge the laws, right? Here's an interesting image. This is a, these are images from today. This is the, uh, in the upper left is the Canadian Supreme Court of modern day. They still wear the attire instituted by King Edward III, right? <laughs> it kind of looks like Santa Claus, right? But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not quite. Um, although it's unclear exactly how or why these French magistrates below uh, still dress this way, um, given their outright rejection of the monarchy, um, this can be found throughout Europe. The lower left is uh, magistrates in France, and I think the lower right as well, but I could be wrong. That could be, uh, that could be an Italian uh, magistrate. But the point is, the lawgivers, right, the original magi handing down the law from God, right, they're the original judges, right? And this is how we get the magistrate. The, this tradition, of course, was, was very much co-opted by the Catholic Church in the early days. And then, of course, this um, power to be a judge, to be a magistrate to the people, eventually filtered down to the king's court, right? That was delegated to the king. So it was only after the death of Queen Mary II in 1694 did the garb of the magistrate change to black and yellow in England. The mourning of Queen Mary II lasted for many years, and the robe of the magistrates stayed black ever since. Notice on the back of the UK magisterial robe, this is the uh, United Kingdom's uh, Supreme Court, in the lower left here, the, the Globus Cruciger, of course, is on top of the crown, and the crown's on top of the, the seal of the Supreme Court. Um, you can't really tell, but the seal has four different um, types of um, flora, and each four represent the, um, the, their respective countries. Uh, England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland. I contacted the Supreme Court uh, and asked them, what does each one mean? I figured it would be one of the four, uh, one for each country, but I wasn't sure. So they were kind enough to get back to me. Um, so, <laughs> But this robe here is very interesting because it has... Uh, Again, even though they switched from this red and white, because, you know, by the, by the 17, 1800s with the Enlightenment in Europe that was spreading throughout Western civilization, there was kind of a moving away from the Holy Roman Magi, moving away from the Vatican, right? But these traditions are still there. The, the just like many words that come to us from old Sanskrit words or old Persian that still have that same exact feeling and meaning that influence is very much there. And this is an interesting, I mean, this reminds me of Harry Potter. I mean, I can't look at these um, members of the United Kingdom Supreme Court without thinking like Hogwarts, right? So uh, the color gold, of course, is the seventh step of alchemy, alchemy and it's symbolic of the intellect and the learned class. There is another place where this exact same style of robe is worn. This is a graduation ceremony of Oxford University in England, where magistrates are trained, right? You have to learn how to be a magistrate. These days, it's, it's less religious and more secular. Oxford is one of the oldest active colleges in the world, where teaching began in 1096. The resemblance between the robes of the UK Supreme Court and the master 
of Oxford University are unmistakable, right? How are these judges, where would these judges get their training? But at the university, of course. After all, it was the Magi whom were the original learned class, right? They were the educated class, which is to say the only group with the knowledge of reading and writing or the, the ability to cast spells. So in a very real sense, this outfit worn by the master of the uh, University of Oxford, he would be like the dean, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> this is very much a traditional garb of the Magi. This is almost like a honoring of this very ancient tradition. It should be, uh, it should logically follow that the scholars and graduates of the oldest universities of the world would most closely follow the traditions set forth by the Holy Roman Magi. After all, the educational center was also, for a very long time in our civilization, the educational center was also the religious center, right? Holding the honor of the oldest university in the Western world goes to the Italian U University of Bologna, which was founded sometime between 1070 and 1088. Now, the founding of this university is very significant because it was traced back to the rediscovery of the Corpus Juris Civilis, which is a body of civil law rediscovered in about 1070. This compilation of laws and writings were derived from the reforms of King Archelaus I of Macedon from 413 to 399 BC. So this is a rediscovery of, of a very old um, code of laws, a collection of laws. Such reforms came directly from laws authored by the Persian Achaemenid Empire. So these laws that were rediscovered that were based on King Archelaus of Macedon were derived directly from Persia. And another thing that's interesting, if you notice these students here at the University of Bologna, these are, um, this is a group of German students. But if you notice their robes, these are the robes of the student or the initiate. Because if you go back... If I go back and show you in the lower right, you can see this, this um, graduation ceremony at Oxford. Those robes are exact. They haven't changed for the student since the time that Oxford had opened. Right? I think it's pretty clear that the university uh, garb for the student was uh, inspired by, these, by the original University of Bologna. Someone may know more about that, but um, that's just kind of my uh, observation. So universities originally came about through the various religious orders affiliated with the Catholic Church. So the dress of the academics was naturally influenced by the clergy, of course, right? And prior to the American Civil War in America, College students wore the cap and gown to every class. You can see this guy in the lower right-hand corner. If you went to college, that's essentially how you had to dress when you were in class. Could you imagine? <laughs> but things were, you know, the uh, religion had a lot more influence at that time, right? So the, the uh, traditions tied to religion would be a lot stronger. One thing is, um, oh, and the Oxford cap, the Oxford cap or flat mortarboard style hat with tassel was actually based upon the beretta worn by Catholic priests. The flatness of the Oxford cap, as you can see in the lower left, this young lady is graduating. She's wearing a classic Oxford cap. The flatness of this cap appears to signify the foundations of knowledge upon which the graduate is to build upon while the color of the tassels indicates the status or the specific discipline of the student, right? This um, mortarboard hat is, th the reason there's a foundation 
here is because college, at least at at least in the in the sense in the original sense of it, it was designed to create a lifelong learner. And so you were to they were giving you a foundation. You weren't done obviously learning anything. You weren't done studying, but they gave you a foundation from which you could branch out and then find your way in the world. Right? Whereas college today is a little different. Um, there's a lot of pressure on on college students to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? Because you have to kind of decide beforehand, um, which is kind of backwards, because you have to decide, you have to commit to some major or some discipline beforehand without even having any experience or really knowing. So that doesn't, I mean, that actually doesn't make any sense. And the older way, uh, the older attitudes about college was that you would build a solid foundation and then you'd go into the world and use your skills to find find yourself and find what you really enjoy and what you're good at. Maybe you found it already in college. Um, great. God bless you. <laughs> good luck. But uh, a lot of folks don't. So. so the one thing is for certain that the educated class and the religious establishment were one and the same for a very long time in Europe. This European Magi class tradition evolved and eventually shifted into the modern day secular parliaments and legislative bodies, right? There is a religious foundation for law. We all know that. There's a separation between uh, the church and state in America but those foundations, the influences, are still there. They had, you know, new, new traditions have to be built from the old, of course, right? So despite these changes over the centuries, the magical operations of language still hold great power. Despite colleges going, you know, you can still go to a, a religious college, you can go to, most colleges are secular now, these traditions have changed quite a bit but the magical operations as far as being a really any kind of um, collegiate study um, requires you to to learn in a way that um, that transforms your life right and, and this is a very transformative power these magical operations are still there Although they're maybe you could say they're they've changed a lot, and you might you might say that some of them are watered down, but they're there if you look closely enough. So the magi, the magistrate, and the magician all derive their powers or authority from the very same source. However, you want to interpret that, right? The U.S. Declaration of Independence, which is a fairly modern document, states that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So that is just a recognition of this filtering down of the, the power of the, um, this filtering down of the power that man has and, of course, the ultimate authority coming down to them from the creator, right? It's not saying the that uh, in the Constitution they're nece they're not saying that um, man has ultimate authority over man. They're still saying that we have certain rights that are given to us from the divine, right? So it's a this idea is very old and it is it's not going anywhere. So you can see in this image, um, of course, you can see Harry Potter, <laughs> and uh, you can see that the the robes are very uh, curiously um, similar to the college system, and also to, of course, the college system would be very similar to the court in a very real sense, because all of the judges come from the college. And all of the word magicians would come from the college. They would be 
uh, attorneys, judges, what have you. In the middle, I just just for fun, I wanted to put an image of Sinterklaas. He is the Scandinavian version of Saint Nicholas or Santa Claus. And of course, he is also wearing the bishop's mitre and he has the red and white. All of these things filter down from religion, ultimately. And so these, um, these religious origins are steeped in magic, right? Because knowledge of the occult in religion is essentially, um, you know, occult, is, occult knowledge and ancient wisdom is the source for the, uh, the religious teachings and this religious understanding. It has many different faces and different names, and we may not recognize it, but it's there, and it's with us today. So that is the end of part two. Um, I believe this is the remnants of the... I think this is the remnants of Cyrus the Great's temple. And I just thought this was a, a great image. So please subscribe if you like the video. Uh, part three is going to be coming up next week. And we're going to go a little bit more into the history. We're going to explore some more word origins. And I'm telling you right now that word magic isn't what you think it is. We're building a foundation here as far as laying out kind of the groundwork for 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 building your understanding higher understanding of what is really happening with these magical operations in our language in our, in our communication so thanks for watching and i'll see you guys next week